Hello, I am Michael Gaucher, and it is March 22nd, 2023. Last time that we spoke, we were upgrading a WPF application that I had been building for a while from an earlier version of .NET and C Sharp to the current latest and greatest. When we finished that discussion, we saw some opportunities for performance improvement. And the funny thing is, a few, um, a few minutes after I uh, concluded that video, I was like, you know what? If I just make this small tweak, and so here I'm going to uh, cover that little small tweak that I made that um, helped the performance of the program and has moved it along to where we ultimately want it to be. Before we start talking about code, I want to mention that there are a few preliminaries in this process. So if you want to see the description of SQL and the database, skip ahead to four minutes into the video. And if you want to look at the code, skip ahead to 12 minutes into the video. Okay, four minutes uh, for SQL and databases, 12 minutes into the video for the software code. So the preliminaries here is Visual Studio updates. Now, I know this sounds like a very uh, trivial or small matter, small thing, but SQL and Visual Studio, they're both based on or affected by updates to the tools that are used in this process and in this environment, right? And so having the tools up to date is very important. Now, if you are in an structured IT environment or an environment where software updates are managed <clears throat> or you have very strict policies and procedures around updates, then the advice here will be a little different. But what I would say is that if you're in an environment where you're controlling the tools and you're also controlling the run times and you want the tools and run times to be at their latest level so that you get the proper bug fixes and updates, then you would probably want to do the updates. So after you do the updates, it is prudent to test them out as I am doing here. So after I finish the updates, I launch Visual Studio to make sure that I can compile programs as I had done and that uh, there hasn't been any major regressions in the output that is produced through Visual Studio. So that's why I went up and I did a clean solution so that it cleans everything. And then I want to run this program and see how it functions in this particular case. So going through the debugger is going to definitely um, add some overhead as mentioned in the previous video. But as we see here, we do have a performance improvements and those performance improvements will be explained here shortly. Here I'm going to launch SQL Server Management Studio, which is the tool that will allow us to interact with the database and make modifications at a database level that will impact the application. So the data for these RSS feeds has been stored in the database <coughs> uh, here that I call RSS data. RSS data um, has a couple of tables called feeds and feeds articles. Feeds list the actual, um, they are essentially a link to the web addresses where the feeds can be pulled from. A feeds article is the data that's been downloaded from those web addresses and kept here in the database. <clears throat> so when I first put down this database and initially set it up, I set it up so that feeds articles, all the data in that table is returned to the software application. So let's take a look at these and let's use the uh, tools in SQL Management Studio to 
um, do our SQL statements for us. Here, the select statement is automatically generated. And you can run this a uh, variety of ways. You can uh, tap the execute um, icon button up at the top, or you can press F5. I prefer F5 uh, myself. I use it, um, you know, quite, quite uh, extensively, but I'm going to use execute here uh, just for illustration purposes. So these are the feeds and basically it gives you the name of the feed in column one, the web address to that feed in column two. <clears throat> so all the software application has to do is use that web address to pull in the latest data. Then feeds articles is where all of that data is gonna go. So let's actually um, generate a SQL script for feeds articles. We'll do it the same way that we did it for the feeds table. We'll right click on feeds article and we will generate a select script. Pretty straightforward. And this is a good way to also generate your select insert update and delete uh, statements in SQL server and then modify them in a more complex form. So here I ran um, the select and I got back 455 rows. This is extremely small uh, data, but it's large enough for our demonstration purposes in terms of performance. So when we take these rows and we multiply them times the number of tabs that we're displaying in the user interface, uh, we get a bit of a bottleneck. Um, depending on how we try to um, express that information. Now, one of the ways in which we get the data to the software application is through a store procedure. And store procedures, they are like functions in a database. They have a name just like a function does um, in your program, but rather than execute software code, they execute SQL and bring back the result to the software application. The result can be in the form of um, the, the results from a query or it could be the number of rows affected uh, when running a what you might call a data manipulation language um, uh, instruction. So, so here we um, have scripted the modification um, script for the store procedure and we see the query that we have um, encoded into this procedure. It's a very straightforward query, um, very basic, and all it does is um, bring back the feeds, right? You could optimize this query a number of ways, but bringing back feed names and web addresses is um, not the bottleneck that we're trying to address here because there are no performance issues with that particular process. What we want to optimize is the, um, the retrieval of the feeds articles, right? And right now we are um, bringing back all the feeds articles, all 455 mm -hmm. of them, right? And this is the store procedure that uh, accomplishes that for us, right? And so what we want to do is um, execute this, see what results we get back, and what we're going to see is we're going to get back 455 rows. So very straightforward. The results are a little different than what we uh, accomplished when we did the raw execution of a select against the feed articles uh, table earlier. And so let's go ahead and script the, um, the store procedure. Uh, let's, let's modify it. And we, we have an order by clause at the bottom. And so basically we are uh, changing the order in which the rows come back. So it's the same information, but it's coming back from the database pre-sorted. Right? There are pros and cons to that when we're talking about database management and we're talking about the optimization of databases and information that's stored in there. In this particular case, I um, cited on the side of um, sorting the information 
because that will reduce the, um, um, the number of operations on the program side where uh, data has to be uh, collated in a sorted uh, fashion. So let's execute uh, this, this, this variation of the same store procedure where we're supplying the feed name. So this is the key optimization that we're going to do for the overall system is we're going to partition the, f the feed data, the feed articles by feed name and we're going to do it at the data layer, at the database layer rather than at the software application layer. By doing it here, we're able to leverage the, the, the encoded algorithms that are implicit to SQL Server and the database engine for partitioning, sorting, and bringing back groups of data versus what you can hand code in the software application. So here I'm bringing back a subset of information based on um, the feed name. And in this particular example, I'm getting back 97 rows. And so when the software application executes this function, this stored procedure, and it uses the same parameter, parameter value, it's going to get back 97 rows instead of 455 rows. And if it so happens that 97 rows of information is all the software application needs, then that's obviously going to take far less time to process than 455 rows. This is what the SQL looks like where I am filtering on the feed name and I have a group by and that is intended to reduce duplicates. That's my intention for using a group by in this case. And I am sorting by the date timestamp uh, when the data was put into the database. And so I no longer need to sort it by the feed name. I can just merely um, sort it by the date timestamp so I can get the data back in the order in which it was uh, put into the database. So let's see what this looks like from a software application standpoint. So I launch Visual Studio and here I have a function called apply feed and apply feed has been adapted so that it uses the new store procedure where it brings back the feed articles filtered by the feed name. And then the apply feed function in turn is going to be, um, be called by the selection changed event handler that we see on line 204, right, on 204. And on line 208, we're going to have um, this, this function here um, that's defined on lines 213 through 231, um, referenced by that's, that selection changed event handler. And then on line 78, right, we see where we have that event handler uh, dispatched or referenced and set up where it will be dispatched. And um, we basically have a hierarchy of calls, right, that starts with the background worker that we talked about in the previous video and how in that asynchronous separate thread of execution, the uh, various feeds are then populated into uh, the relevant tabs. So this is the uh, function in our uh, data exchange uh, class, right, that is um, referencing the store procedure. And we see the parameter value being passed there. And then the data is collected into these variables as it goes through the case statement. And we have this, um, this, this if statement that um, looks for the existence of that, that article. And if that article doesn't exist, it then establishes a new record. And you'll recall that one of the reasons we updated to .NET 7 and C-Sharp 11 was to make full use of this record type, right? And so we are successfully using the record type and the proper syntax for establishing a record, right? In this case, a read-only record and an immutable type, which is going to have less um, operational requirements 
when the code is running. So that's going to benefit us from a performance standpoint. And so now we're um, now we're seeing the bigger picture on uh, this updated function. This is the function that was previously used, right? It has the same name, so we're doing function overloading. But this one doesn't filter on feed name, right? We were just getting. Previously, we're just getting all of the feed articles, and you notice we that added just a little bit more complexity so that we had a um, hierarchical set of what you might call dictionary types. In this case, the sorted list type in the .NET uh, framework, .NET base class library. And so um, that meant that we had more computational complexity, right? The complexity of our algorithms um, meant that we had a higher time cost for uh, the, the decision to bring back all of that data and to put it in a form that was convenient from a code standpoint uh, to access and to write code against. And so we've now um, gotten the best of both worlds by getting the database in gear with our overall strategy while at the same time simplifying the code at the user interface and the application level, right? So now that we've done that and I've cleaned the solution, I, I want to essentially run this through the debugger and see what the performance looks like from that standpoint. And then I would uh, like to run this um, in release mode. Uh, release mode should be your final test. You, you shouldn't really uh, go straight from debugging to production because that creates issues where some of the ways that the application may behave in a debug uh, mode can greatly differ from the way it can uh, behave in its final release mode. So you need to do unit testing and integration testing in both modes. But putting that aside, um, I am uh, running it through the debugger because uh, the debugger is going to um, comb through, in, in, a, in, a, in a broader way of speaking, it's going to comb through all of the functions to see um, if there's any uh, technical errors and identify those errors to us through the Visual Studio integrated development environment. The tabs have loaded and we're able to click through the tabs and we're getting a much better um, performance response, right? And so things are looking really good here. And so um, I'm quite pleased with how this has evolved since the first time that we looked at this um, a few months ago. So now I want to run this again, but I want to run it without having the Visual Studio debugger examining every line of code as it runs, which is going to allow us to run it closer to the native way that um, it will in the real world. So um, one of the ways that we'll, that we'll do that is we'll run the release version of the program. And the great thing about the release version of the program is that we exclude Visual Studio if we want, and we are not um, subject to um, the overhead of having it fully documented with debugging information in the executable. Okay? So, but um, in this particular exercise, I want to delete the uh, release uh, version that was generated by Visual Studio and just regenerate it from scratch. It just uh, uh, works better from a testing standpoint to make sure that, um, number one, given that we just recently updated Visual Studio, right, and that we um, uh, want to be sure that we have the latest version of the program uh, there because when you generate these debug and release versions, they could sit there on a the hard drive um, for days, weeks, and in some cases years. <laughs> and so you just want to make sure that you have the latest version. So um, here I'm, I'm running the build over in uh, Visual Studio so I can see the generation of the release version in real time over on the file system on the left. And uh, there it is. So the, the, uh, the, the Visual Studio toolset has compiled the program and uh, generated it. And so now just right click and choose open, right? And doing the right click in the open is actually a good way to do this because you're never sure if your double click has actually taken, right? 
And so anyway, and we see that we got good response time on the load of the screen. Uh, each click is about a second or two, right? And so that's not, that's not bad. So um, very, very good progress. And just that one tweak has put us in a good position. What pleases me about that entire process is how straightforward performance optimization really is. Yes, there is science and there is definite empirical and structured technique and information that's out there about improving performance. But at the same time, there's a great deal of it that is common sense. So what I would advise is that uh, when you have a huge performance issue, think back to the fundamentals, think back to the basics, and that will be a sure guide to success and where you need to go. The journey from here, I anticipate that I'm going to upgrade this program to use an embedded database. Right now, it's connecting to a version of SQL, SQL Server, that you might call uh, more of a server-based uh, version of SQL Server. You can run it on the desktop, sure, uh, but this version of SQL Server is a bit heavy if I were to deploy this application. So, just like it's Linux cousin, right, I'm going to switch this application to an embedded database of some kind, and I haven't decided what I'm going to do there, but um, I'm sure to uh, keep you informed on that progress and on the journey ahead. So thank you for uh, joining in on this discussion, and I hope it finds you well. I hope your week goes well. And if you have any questions or you just want to drop a comment, feel free to do so. Like the video so that I can know if this content is resonating with you or if there's more clarifications that I can offer. Thank you.